Hello everyone, welcome along to the football show here at Betfred. Delighted to say that former England goalkeeper Paul Robinson is with me in the studio to look through the next few days in the Premier League and of course reflect on the first week back in the top tier, Paul. Welcome back to the studio. Uh, it's been a pretty predictable restart to the Premier League, I think. I was having a look earlier. Every team in the top 10 won, bar the draw between Spurs and Brentford, and every team in the bottom half lost bar Wolves, who got that great win at Goodison Park. Yeah, they looked good, Wolves. Uh, they had to change the manager. But it's nice to have the Premier League back, isn't it? I mean, as much as we've loved the World Cup, we've all enjoyed being in studio watching the World Cup, there's nothing like the Premier League, the action that we get week in and week out. The first game, the, the Spurs-Brentford game, I was obviously at that game. Spurs, again, predictably poor to start with. Got back, back into the game, having to get yourself back into too many games. Wolves, like you touched on, new manager. Villa, a little bit disappointing after a start. It's going to be interesting to see, Sean, as to... Who hits the ground running, if you like, because this break came at a bad time for some and a good time for others. So you look at teams going into that break who were in form, didn't want that to happen. And you're looking now, what's been interesting for me in the first weekend back is to see how players have been used. Certain players who went deep into the tournament, I mean Perisic, for example, at Tottenham, third and fourth place playoff, the day before the final, comes back and plays, who's almost played every minute of the World Cup. Lloris, who's, OK, he's a goalkeeper, not as physical exertion as that, plays, has one more day there, yet doesn't play and only comes back training the day before. So it's interesting how the managers are handling different characters. Well, there's two lines of thought, wasn't there, that the players who have been playing competitively over this period would actually come back and be sharper, or would those players be tired? Mm. It, and it seems like the players that were at the World Cup have performed well, whereas the players who've had a rest, maybe it's a bit like pre-season, they need yeah. a bit of time to get going. Take them a little bit of time to get going. I think the thing that is, from the World Cup, I think it's more of a mental fatigue, more of a mental hangover as to how the team's performed, how you've performed personally. So I don't think if you look at it, we've played, I mean, with yesterday's and the other Christmas's fixtures, it's taken some teams up to 15, 16 games. So you add England's five games onto that, that's 20 games. We'd be around about that point anyway mm. for the Premier League. So the amount of fixtures fatigue and that is not going to take too much toll. Now we'll see how that affects players later on in the season. OK, well, there's certainly plenty of goals on the weekends. Uh, the last few days, 34 goals, in fact, in that round, so nearly three and a half per game. And speaking of goals, we've got to talk about last night and Erling Haaland, who got another two goals. He's breaking records every game, it seems. He's now the fastest player to hit 20 goals in a Premier League season with 14 appearances, uh, beating Kevin Phillips' 21 appearances back in the day. So he just keeps on getting goals. And, I mean, they're not spectacular, are they? But... You need to get in those positions and read the game like he does and get himself in these sorts of spaces where you can get those tap-ins. The machine continues, doesn't it? I mean, anybody who's backed him to score at any point this season or backed him to, to break records is looking like they're going to be quids in at the moment. I think I watched him closely last night. He was playing Leeds. He doesn't do a lot. This is going to sound really silly. I mean, you, you look at Mbappe, you look at Messi, you look at those type of players who can dominate a game and win a game. Haaland almost needs his team around him to win a game. He's capable of doing it, but his runs are very simple, they're very clever, they're well-timed, he's got very educated runs. He puts himself in the right positions, like you said. You watch him, eight out of his ten runs are straight, but he knows when to time his runs, and when you've got players like Rodri, De Bruyne, players like that, Grealish, Foden, in around you that can give you the service, he's going to score. He's a real handful. He's not an Mbappe, he's not a Messi, but he's a goal scorer, and he's got that service. You look at that City team around him, the amount of assists that they've got, Look at the goals that City scored last year without him. And this year, the ones he's dominating the goal scoring because he's got the capability to do so. He's, if he keeps fit and he stays in this league for a long time, he's going to go on and break a lot of records. Well, we'll get to that shortly. He has already run up some brilliant stats so far. He's actually scored more than nine Premier League clubs have in total so far on this season on his own. <laughs> and he's actually played one game less than seven of those teams as well. He's already matched or bettered, as you can see, at the Golden Boot total for six other previous seasons in the Premier League. And there you can see the nine clubs that he has scored more than. At his current rate, if he played all but two of the remaining Premier League games, he would score exactly 50 goals this season in the top tier. It, it's just incredible, and he's making it look very easy. Mind-blowing in, in the Premier League. I mean, you look at 50 goals a season in all competitions is almost mind-blowing. There's not many people that you'd back to do that in a, in a, in a season, never mind in the Premier League. Can he do that over a Premier League season? Yeah, of course he can. I mean, he's got to this point now. Um, we're not even halfway through the season yet, are we? We touched on that a minute ago. Mm. The games that he's got left, if he can stay fit, listen, if he stays fit, he plays. Regardless of who the opposition is, he's, he, he wants to play, he's going to play, and he'll score goals, who, whoever he's playing against. 
Well, you touched upon records. Let's have a look at some of the potential records that he could break this season. I'm sure he's looking at Salah. He's 12 goals away from Salah's 32-goal total. That's a record in the 38-game season. He could do that in two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Cole and Shearer scored 34 back when it was 42 games. I mean, thinking about it, Dixie Dean, he scored 60 goals. That is a top-flight record in England. And Messi scored 50 in La Liga back in 2011-12. That's a record modern day in the top five European leagues. So he's got Messi in his sights, hasn't he? Yeah, the Messi record's more than realistic. I think, you know, Salah's goal is 12 goals away from Salah's record in, in 32 and a 38 game Premier League season. You can do that. I think you look at the team that he's playing and the opportunities that he's going to get. I mean, we're, we're talking the day after the Leeds game and the, he scored two in that game. But Elan Melier was actually very, very good in the Leeds goal last night. Haaland could have had a hat-trick and more. So the chances that he's going to get given to him, he's got every opportunity to, to, to get near those records. 50 in this season is more than realistic for him. Listen, it's, it's going to be hard to do. Don't get me wrong. That's him staying fit, playing every game and scoring consistently the way that he has. But believe me, if he's on the pitch and there's a penalty, he's going to take a penalty. You can almost back him to score two every home game if they're playing a bottom of the half league team. So, yeah, there's, there's, he's got every chance. OK, let's get to some prices then. If you do fancy backing Haaland to go big and maybe get to some of those records, we can give you some prices throughout the rest of the season. So what about Haaland maybe to get that 50-goal mark? That's available at 12-1, to 1, which is tempting. 45 goals is at 4-1. to 1. If you fancy matching Dixie Dean, that's 100-1. to 1. And then, well, 38 goals, goal per game, basically 1-2, to 2, 39, 4-6, to 6, and 40s even money. So... <laughs> It's amazing that we have to get to 40, over 40 goals to get better than evens, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that shows you what type of player he is. 45 goals at 4-1. to one. I mean, if, you, if you're looking for real value, that's where you're looking. That's, you know, you're pushing the boat out for him to get that. But we just said he's capable of doing it. The fact that he's got to get to 40 goals to get better odds than evens shows you where he is. I mean, if he scores another six or seven goals in the next two weeks, those odds are going to come in very quickly. Will we be looking back in 10 years' time and saying this is the best striker we've ever seen in the Premier League? Or could you argue maybe if they had City had a Rooney or a Shearer or a Kane in that side, they would have done just the same? Potentially, yeah. I think Harry Kane will be looking at this situation, thinking that he's missed, missed the boat here. Because I think it was, it was well documented about his want to leave and the link with City was there. And City scored all those goals without a real number nine. They've obviously solved that problem now. Given those chances, Kane would score the same goals. He's not the same type of player. He's playing a lot deeper at the moment for Spurs and he drops into other positions and he wouldn't have to do that at City. Haaland, if he can stay fit and if he's, if he's got a desire to stay in this league, I think the thing for Haaland is keeping matching his ambition to the club's ambition. Pep Guardiola has got one thing left to do at City and it's win the Champions League. We know that. That's what he was brought in to do. That's the holy grail for him is the Champions League. If City regularly are in the top two, which they're looking like they are going to be, I mean, his squad of players is fantastic. If City are challenging for the Champions League on a regular basis, where else in the world does Haaland want to play his football unless he harbours personal ambitions to play elsewhere? So, yeah, he's more than capable of breaking all kinds of records. But for me, City, I look at their squad, you know, I looked at their squad this morning before I came in and looking at people who are going to strengthen in January. There's only one position that City could potentially strengthen its right back. They haven't got, if Cancelo plays left back no. or right back, it's the full back area. Is the, oh, if you're really, really looking at their squad thinking, where can they strengthen it? That's the only place, is fullback areas. I can see them going on. I can see them passing Arsenal this season. OK, we'll get to City and to Haaland very shortly. They play on Saturday against Everton. But let's have a look at the live games over the weekend in the Premier League. And we'll start off with Liverpool taking on Leicester Friday night, 8 o'clock at Anfield. Liverpool, the big favourites, Paul, as you'd expect. Three Premier League wins in a row for the first time this season. Leicester... A disappointing loss to Newcastle, their ninth loss of the season. And the worry for me was Brendan Rodgers said they didn't have the right attitude. That rings alarm bells for me. They look like they turned the corner, didn't they, Leicester? I think, you know, we talked about teams that the break hasn't done them any good, and I think they were probably one. And I think it was the way that they lost at home to Newcastle at the weekend was the more worrying thing. I think if they've only, I'm looking at the form guard now, they've only lost two of their last six, four wins and two losses. But then the unpredictability of them and the way that they, they kind of fell over against Newcastle and were blown away, they didn't offer much. Mm. I think goal scoring for them has been an issue. The thing that they had at the start of the season was conceding goals. And Brendan Rodgers, and I did a game for a, for a broadcaster there, and we had Brendan Rodgers out and we asked him. And he said, look, it was just as they'd started to turn the corner. And he said it's an old-fashioned thing, but they want to build uh, a comeback, if you like, on defensive stability. And they started to do that. But the ease that they, they, they conceded goals against Newcastle would be worrying. Out Faye for me is about Fass is an excellent centre half. I think they need to get that right with him. 
Um, Madison, they cannot afford to lose him in January. There's huge talk about him going potentially Newcastle, Tottenham, etc. And I think if Leicester are to be where they want to be or should be in the league, that they need to keep players like that. I think going to Anfield at this stage of the season is a big ask for them. I think Liverpool had a great win at Villa. Um, they've obviously we know the injury problems they've got, um, and with Cody Gakpo coming into that team now, it could be a real boost for Liverpool just at the right time. OK, yeah, they may have turned a corner. They're as short as four to seven to get in the top four Liverpool this season. Uh, what would your prediction be for that game, best bet? I think it'd be comfortable for Liverpool. I think you're not going to get much, much value back in Liverpool at home against a, an out-of-form Leicester side, let's say. So you're looking at goals, you're looking at goal scorers. I've written down here in my prediction, I've written down 4-0. So, I mean, you, you just be, be creative. I think Liverpool will win. I think they'll win comfortably. I can see them winning to nil as well with the problems that Leicester have got going forward. Pick your amount, pick your goal scorer, be creative with your bet. Do a build a bet. Don't just back Liverpool unless you put them in your acker. OK, let's move on to Wolves taking on Manchester United Saturday, 12.30, kick-off at Molyneux. At Manchester United, odds on after another win. That's 11 wins in the last 14 games now in all competitions. Uh, Wolves, though, they've had a great first week, haven't they, under Lopetegui, winning the EFL Cup, and then that comeback we mentioned at Everton. Yeah, and he's got the transfer window to come as Lopetegui. I think it's, uh, it's a real coup for them to get a manager of his quality. I think you, you look at that, they went for him the first time around, it didn't work. They held out for the man and they've got him. I think the way that they played against Everton at the weekend, at times Everton were the better team, um, but they got the result, which is what you have to do when you're down there. I mean, they're still in the bottom three, looking at where they are. That's their first win in six, and it's, it's going to be a big ask for them against United. But the old cliche is, oh, you've got to turn your, you know, your, your home into a fortress, got to make it difficult. I mean, when we always used to play Molyneux, they were in the Premier League, it was always a very difficult place to go. Fans were always noisy, passionate, the team worked very hard at home. And I think under Lopetegui, they'll get back to that work ethic. I think at times they've, they've missed that this year of Wolves. But I think what the first thing he'll do is he'll make them hard to beat and they'll make them resilient. OK, we pushed out Wolves to 13-8 to eight to be relegated. And United are now into 11-10 to 10 for the top four, by the way. But as far as this game is concerned, what do you think? They've got a chance of top four United as well, haven't they? I mean, you look at the table now and you look how congested it is. Arsenal City... Um, are looking like it's going to be between them. Newcastle third, who a lot of people didn't think were going to be there. Spurs, United, Liverpool. You, know, you look at the top four and there's, there's, there's no United, no Liverpool, no Chelsea. Chelsea is sitting down in eighth. So United have got a real opportunity, especially the way that they played. I think Ten Hag's doing it his way. I think he's got to have a lot of credit for what he's done. Rashford in form. I looked at their team. Ones that played in the World Cup that have come out. Varane, Shaw, Casemiro, Eriksen, Fernandes, Anthony, Rashford. All came into the team, all started and all looked good. I think for me, they, they, they're a completely different outfit as to what they were six to eight months ago. It'll be difficult for them at Wolves, but back to your original question, I think they've got too much for Wolves. I think Wolves will score, but I've gone for a United 2-1 win. OK, United on the goal scorer extra might be the way to go. Just a quick one before we move on as well. The last time that United lost on New Year's Eve was against your Blackburn Rovers side back in 2011. 3-2. Yeah, and I'm led to believe I didn't play. You didn't that. play in That's the game. That's why we though. won. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say it myself. Uh, right, let's move on then. Brighton take on Arsenal. 5.30 kickoff on Saturday night at the Amex. Arsenal five points clear at the top once again. 13 wins from 15 so far in the Premier League this season. Brighton, though, the last team to beat Arsenal in the League Cup this season. And they actually got four points off them last season as well. So they are a bit of a bogey side for the Gunners. I like Brighton this year. I really like Brighton. I was concerned when the new manager came in. I actually put a, a sneaky outside bet on myself for them to go down this year when the new manager came in. We didn't know much about them. Watched them before the break at Manchester City, covered the game for a broadcaster, and they were excellent. The way that he's got them drilled, the way that he's got them playing, the two wing-backs pushing on. Trossard, for me, I think he's probably one of the most underrated players in the Premier League. I believe that he will go on. He'll play Champions League football. But the way that they play under De Zerbi, I think they, with Solly March, Lalana's in that number 10 role, and I think they can cause Arsenal problems, I really do. Yeah, they look good, didn't they, against Southampton? They've won three of the last four now in the Premier League, have Brighton. But it's an important game for Arsenal because you look at the next two after this, it's Newcastle, Tottenham and Manchester United all in a row. Yeah. So they keep saying to... that about Arsenal, don't we? We keep saying, oh, they've got a test to come. But they keep answering all the questions. And that's, True. That's the big thing you can say about this Arteta's Arsenal. We say, oh, you know, are they, I'm, I'm one of them. It says, oh, they won't stay there. They won't last the, the test of time. They've got a huge test now because Jesus, as we know, is out. For me personally, they haven't got enough in the squad. They have to go out in January and get somebody. They're looking at one of the wide players, I think, from Shakhtar Donetsk. Mm. I think being outpriced at the moment. But for me, he's a wide player. They need a number nine. They need a goal scorer. They've got Martinelli. They've got Smith Rowe. They've got a lot of Saka. They've got a lot of quality in that area. They need a number nine, but they need a number nine who will give you the work rate that Jesus does. Not just the goals, because if you look at Jesus' goal scoring record the last few weeks, 
it's before the, the World Cup, it wasn't there. But what he gives the team in other areas, I think they have to recruit there. But I think this Arsenal team, the strongest one that I've seen in a long time, proof about giving your manager time, sticking with it, trusting the process. We hear that saying so often. But he's, he's done great as Arteta. Can they finally get one over the Seagulls then? No, I don't think they can. I think Brighton are strong. I think they're strong at home. I've put down a one-all draw because I, I've, I've liked what I've seen from Brighton. And they, you know, they went to, went to Southampton, um, got a good win on the back of the World Cup. He looks to be continuing what he's doing there. And I think it's a difficult place to go now. So I'm going to go for a one-all draw. OK, let's move on to Sunday then. Two o'clock kick-off. It's your former side, Tottenham, taking on Aston Villa. As Spurs are odds-on in this game, but they had to come from behind again, again to get a result against Brentford. They've now conceded in their last nine games in a row in all competitions. I thought Villa played well, actually, against Liverpool. It was touch and go for a, a, a time there. They obviously got off to a great start under Emery. So are you confident going into this? Not overly confident, no. Not the way that Spurs defend and, and who plays in that back three. Um, Longley and Tanganga played at the weekend. And then after an hour, he took um, Tanganga off and put Davinson Sanchez on. It's an area that they're really weak in. If Romero's not back, which who knows where Romero is after the World Cup. I mean, if I'd won the World Cup, you probably wouldn't see me for a month <laughs> or two. So he's, he's probably out celebrating, rightly so. Yeah. I think Lloris will come back into the side for, for Tottenham. But defensively, it does worry me for Spurs because you look at the goal that they conceded against Brentford, the zonal marking from corners. But then you look how the corner was conceded, the error, the error from Eric Dyer. They don't have enough quality. Eric Dyer is very, very good in the centre of a three when he's got two good players either side of him. And they haven't had that for a, a, a long time this season. They concede too many. Yes, Villa under Emery look like they're a different prospect. Players the same. Louise looks different for me. McGinn, Buendia. Buendia seems to be coming into it. Watkins got his goal the other day. I think it'll be a tough game for Spurs, but I think with the, the home advantage, um, I think that they've got enough to see this Aston Villa team off. I think they will cause Spurs a, a threat but I think Villa will look to play on the break with Watkins and Spurs will they'll play deep because that's what they do. I can see Spurs winning it to nil, Sean. OK, well, if you do fancy Villa to get off to a good start, Spurs another slow start, you can back Villa half-time 7-2. to two, And I had a look as well. Villa to be leading at half-time and then Spurs to win the game at full-time is 20-1. to one, So could whoever, it be 10 in a row? Whoever's made those odds up haven't been watching Spurs recently. No, nine games in a row. <laughs> that's okay. not a bad bet. This time, it's a win to nil for Spurs for Paul. Right, let's move on to the final live game on Sunday, 4.30 kick-off. It is Nottingham Forest taking on Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea got their first win in six games in the Premier League against Bournemouth. Uh, they're still 4-1, to one, though, for the top four. And Forest in the bottom three after that defeat to Manchester United, 4-7 to seven to be relegated. I guess the only positive for Forest is they do get lots of the results here at the City ground. They beat Liverpool in the league, yeah. they beat Spurs in the League Cup, so that will be the only hope, I guess, for them to get a result on Sunday. Yeah, I think that's their only way of staying in this league as well, is turning the city ground into a fortress. But who knows? January's only around the corner. Transfer window's open. They might get another 30 players. You never know. <laughs> yeah. You know what Forrest do in the transfer window. Um, I can't see wanting to change it that much. I think they will have some potential activity. But I think it, this is a tough game for them. I think they've, you know, they've gone to Old Trafford. They've lost 3-0. OK, fair enough. That's not a season-defining game for them. These are the games where they are going to be the underdog going into the game. And if you're an underdog backer, there's going to be a little bit of value. And Forrest are capable. You know, if you look at the statistics, you look at everything logistically, you think, no, they're not going to beat this Chelsea side. But if Chelsea don't turn up, we know that they're still a team in transition. Graham Potter's looking forward to the transfer window because he wants to bring in reinforcements and mould the side into what it is. So, I mean, Chelsea at home to Bournemouth the other day, they looked comfortable. They, they played particularly well. One of the best performers, I think, under Potter. Going to Forest is never going to be easy for them. But I can't see this Forest team causing them a problem. I'm looking at what I've got here. And Forest sat second to bottom. Two wins in the last six. It's going to be difficult for them to get out of the bottom three all season. For me, Forest are going to be one of those teams that are in the bottom three battling to get out of it all season. OK, so best bet for you in the game? 2-0. I think um, going forward, I think we saw Lingard play as a nine, which shows me that Steve Cooper's not quite happy the way the forward line's going. I think it would be difficult to break this Chelsea defence down, even though Koulibaly hasn't been all that this year with, with Thiago Silva next to him. And I think um, it, Chelsea will be strong enough. They'll have enough firepower to get the goals. And I just don't think Forrest have got enough to break them down. So 2-0 away win. OK, let's go back to Friday night and have a look at the non-televised games now. It's West Ham taking on Brentford at the London Stadium, 7.45 kick-off. The Hammers are favourites, but just one point above the bottom three. Four defeats in a row now for David Moyes' side. They were fourth at this stage of the season last season. Mm. And, of course, they reached the semi-finals of the Europa League as well. So it's been some turnaround, hasn't it? Struggling, aren't they, West Ham? They're, they're really struggling. Surprisingly so when you look at what they've got on paper. 
You look at their starting eleven. You look at their squad this season. I look at the squad this season compared to last season. Well, they spent they're, money, didn't they? It's stronger, you know. But they've they've lost Skamaka now. Suchet doesn't look the same player as he was last year for me. They've, it's it's a not a good combination. They've conceded too many goals. But then you look at their form away from home in the Europa Conference League, and I think they're unbeaten. I think they've won every game. They're, they're exceptional on the road. On the road in the Premier League, they're they're a different outfit. There's something that's just not quite clicking for David Moyes. I think the injury to Skamaka in a way allows Antonio a run of games. So it allows him a clear head, knowing that he's going to get an opportunity, rather than if he doesn't score after 60 minutes, he's coming off in an hour. But they're playing a Brentford side who, under Thomas Frank, what a nice guy he is, by the way, I interviewed him the other day on Boxing Day. He's genuinely a really good guy. And he, he comes across, he's very open in what he talks about, his budget, about his players. You can see the way that the players re respect him. Uh, his man management skills are excellent. And he's got a Brentford team there on the second lowest budget in the Premier League, punching well above their weight. Arsenal, the only team to win at the Brentford Stadium this season. They've taken some big scalps. Tottenham couldn't do it the other day. And I've, since meeting him, my respect for him has, has gone up. And I think the, the team that he's got now, we, we all know there's an issue around Ivan Tony, which I think is, is coming up. That's to be decided. If they miss him, that could be season-defining for them because mm. he's so big for them. Him and Mbwemo together at the front two have got a great understanding. But it's, it's going to be a tough one for West Ham. I can see Brentford going there and get a result, although I've written down in my predictions, I've written down a one-all draw because I think West Ham, I still think there's, there's more to come from them. I don't think the way that they played against Arsenal the other night was a, a true reflection. I've gone for a one-all draw, but don't be surprised if Brentford nick this one. Yeah, they're a big price, 11-4, to four, the Bees, to win the game. It wasn't long ago that they beat City, of course, and beaten in four now, and they actually went home and away against the Hammers last season as well. So... You never know. Right, let's move on. Saturday, 3 o'clock, Bournemouth taking on Crystal Palace. Very tight one to call in the betting, this one. Uh, the Cherries have now lost five of the last six. Only three points clear at the bottom three. They're also a short price, four to seven, to be relegated. Palace, they had an absolute shocker, though, didn't they, against Fulham? Down mm. to nine men, a capitulation. They need to show some fight in this game. Well, they've got two players missing through suspension. And like you say, the, the form teams in the Premier League, they're not Bournemouth. West Ham and Palace are slipping that way as well. Um, Palace have, they're doing okay, sitting in 11th. I think the thing with Palace, Vieira's got an, a, a plethora of attacking players, quality players, and he's trying to get them all on the pitch, and at times defending is not their, their priority. I think Bournemouth, they've obviously given Gary O'Neill the job. I think they've got a real tough job to stay in the league this year. I'm looking at the bottom three, and I'm looking all the way up to Leicester, Villa. It's so close there that, you know, Bournemouth, for me, could get sucked into this. I think Southampton and Forest will struggle, but I think Bournemouth could get sucked into this. Again, home form is going to be vitally important to them. They only lost at Chelsea 2-0. They've, they've put on a decent show for themselves. But Palace, is, it's worrying times with Tompkins and Mitchell getting sent off. Two key players for them, by mm -hmm. the way. So they'll be missing against Bournemouth. And it's, it's, it's a really, really difficult one to call. So I've written on my sheet, Sean, I've written, Bournemouth have won one in six, Palace have won the la lost the last two. So I've actually sat on the fence and yeah. have to pull splinters out again. I've gone 1-1. One, one. I don't blame you. That's around a 2-1 to one shot. I think that'll be very popular. Uh, Bournemouth, though, by the way, they have conceded the most goals in the Premier League this season, so it might be a score draw. We shall see. Uh, Fulham take on Southampton, 3 o'clock at Craven Cottage on Saturday. Uh, Fulham in ninth now after that win against Palace. A great start for them after promotion. Uh, Southampton, in contrast, booed off at the weekend after that loss against Brighton. Now... Going back to last season, if you count the, the final few games of last season, I had a look. Three wins in the last 21 league games. That's Southampton. Mm. I think they're in trouble. I, I mean, I sat in the studio at the beginning of the season, I can't remember whether it was Mark or Matt or whoever was presenting, or whether it was you, Sean, and they were my tip to go down. I've, I think they've, they've rode their luck so often. Under Ralph House and Huttle, they've managed to get results. They've gone on runs in the last two seasons where they've been in the top three, the bottom three, and then they've got beaten nine twice. They've, they've shipped goals. They haven't won games you'd expect them to win. And I just think their, their run of luck's come to an end in the Premier League. I think Nathan Jones, yes, he's a good, upcoming, promising manager. I don't think he was the right appointment for them. I think maybe long term, he'll be developing to a, a top manager. But at the moment, I don't think he's what was needed. I don't think he'll be the manager that keeps them in this league. It doesn't like he's, like he's going to be pragmatic, does he? It looks no. like he's going to play his way his and that way. might not be the way to get out of it. Not with this group of players because that has, that's proven that it's not worked in the past. I think Ward Prowse got his goal at the weekend. Shea Adams back in the team playing again. I just look at this team and I can't see a way out for Southampton. I really can't. Fulham, on the flip side of that, they've been brilliant this year. And with Mitrovic in form, scoring goals, he's got a real set way of playing. Um, Robinson, the left back, how good is he in the World Cup as well? He was fantastic. The problem that the manager's going to have is keeping this group of players together because already with Fulham sitting ninth this season on 22 points, 
you'd think almost another 10, 12 points, they're safe again for, the, for this season. Best bet for you, Fulham are the even money favourites. Yeah, Fulham. I mean, what have I gone for here? Let me have a look. I've got Fulham 3 0. So I, I think it's they've, they've been very good at home at the, at the cottage. And I think Southampton's woes will continue on the road. 3-0 okay. Fulham. The only saving grace perhaps for Southampton is the runner fixtures. I had a look earlier. So the next six games for the Saints, Fulham, Forest, Everton, Villa, Brentford, Wolves. There is a double-edged sword to that, though. Yes. If they don't pick up the points, then they are in trouble. <laughs> yes, but at least an opportunity for them, is An isn't opportunity, it? Going yeah. forward. Right, let's go back to Manchester City then and Erling Haaland. Saturday, 3 o'clock, they host Everton at the Etihad. They are incredibly short to win this game. Now five points behind Arsenal once again. They're two to five favourites to win the title. Everton, three defeats in a row. They've lost seven of the last nine. The six to four for relegation. I mean, mm. Frank Lampard must be getting worried, mustn't he? Definitely, and the fact he hasn't got a striker or can't score goals is, is another worrying factor for him. Mope's done well, but he's not an out-and-out. Out. Number nine, he's not a striker. The goals are not going to come from Matt Neil Gordon. And I think we looked at this looked at it a few weeks ago. And I think Jordan Pickford had more assists at the time, not now, than Anthony Gordon and, and McNeil. And I think the, the worrying thing for Everton is they've got that horrible combination of conceding goals and not scoring them. Their inability to score goals. I mean, listen, this for Everton is not going to define their season. This isn't going to decide whether they stay up or go down. They're going to go there. They've got to try and shut out City for as long as they can, stay in this game. But I mean, I, I saw Brentford at the Etihad before the, the World Cup break. They went there and they did a real job on them. They played the long ball. City didn't like it. They, they worked on set pieces and they worked on areas and how to disrupt City. So it's not an unassailable task to say that Everton could go and get something. Realistically, can they? Do I think they can? No, I don't. I think you've got to be creative with this. Put City in your, in your acre. That'll give you another 0.0% or whatever you're going to get for them <laughs> yeah. at home against the poor Everton team. I think you get, you've got to back your goal scorers, your, your, your goals, uh, how many, what time, corners, bookings, bet builder, be creative. Yeah. You've City got to put, don't lose this. You've got to put Haaland in there, haven't you? Now, he's only 4-11 to 11 to score at any point in the game. What about a hat-trick? you got a hat-trick for me. He's 11-2 to two to get a hat-trick. That's not a bad shout. Yeah. He could get a penalty and he's more than capable of doing that. He's 13-8 to eight to get two or more. He's also 13-8 to eight to score the first goal. And we are David like hat-trick heaven on the game as well. So, include him and like you say... 13-8, to eight, two or more for Haaland. Mm. City win. Put in some corners, put in some bookings. You're going to have to be creative to get your money's worth out of City this season, especially at home. OK, let's move on to Newcastle against Leeds, one of your former sides once again. St James's Park, Saturday, 3 o'clock kickoff. The Magpies entering the weekend in third. Sixth Premier League win in a row the other day against Leicester. They've only lost once. Remember, that was in the 98th minute at Anfield. And they've still got the best defence in the Premier League. I mean, how high can they go for? They've been great, haven't they? Listen, I think they've reached the ceiling, third. That's where they realistically can go. You know, Champions League spot is what Eddie Howe won't be saying openly, but what they'll be looking at in-house, thinking, right, well, we're third now, we've got 33 points, we've got a real platform to build from, we've got a real opportunity to do this. The Leeds team that I saw against Manchester City, I was wor I'm, I'm worried for Leeds this season, in, in all honesty. I'm looking at the bottom, bottom of the table. Southampton Forest, for me, possibly gone. Lopetegui coming in at Wolves, I think they could turn around, so they've got the quality too. Everton, I don't think, will stay down there. West Ham will pull away. Leeds, Bournemouth could well get pulled in. I think from a Leeds point of view, I'm still not convinced by the manager, still not taken by the manager. The worst two results that Leeds could have possibly got this season for me was Leed, uh, Liverpool away when they won and Bournemouth when they won at home that week because that kept him his job. That in the long term could prove to be the, the relegation for Leeds. It might not be. I may be wrong. I hope I am. They play too narrow. They play very narrow and they have a narrow platform. The way Aston to press from that base leaves them wide open. A couple of team selection issues. I'd like to see Luke Ayling back in the side. Cooper on a more regular basis. And I think Leeds are going to Newcastle at a very, very difficult time for them. I think Newcastle are on the, on the up. As you say, what's the ceiling? Champions League plays realistically for them. Almiron has been a different player this season. Listening to, to talk sport on the way in, the, talking about players of the season and outside players of the season. And he's won because of where he's been and where he's put himself. Well, on that point, because I had a look at his goal record earlier, he scored nine goals in the Premier League this season. That matches the previous three seasons for him combined. Yeah. So he's that just shows, player. doesn't it? Different player, playing with a lot of confidence. I think the thing for Newcastle is the fitness of Callum Wilson. It's often discussed, uh, but Chris Wood did a great job the other day, led the line, allowed the others in behind him to do the damage. What Eddie's done is he's give them an identity. They play a 4-3-3 when they're in possession, but kind of out of possession, the two wing back, the, the two forward wingers out the, the three drop in and make a solid five in midfield. So they almost play with a 4-5-1 out of possession and they're very hard to break down. They boss the midfield, they win the midfield, 
and it's going to be a very, very big ask for Leeds to go up there at the weekend. Best bet for you in the game then? I've written down a score of both teams to score, but Newcastle to win. OK, they are only 2-5 to five to win the game, so maybe be creative, get the goals score extra in there. By the way, they're as short as 11-10 to 10 now for the top four Newcastle, and 7-2 to two for Leeds to be relegated might tempt you. I, it, it wouldn't tempt me, no, because I, <laughs> well, I, I would never back yes. against them. But it might be one that, you know, if they do go down, it might soften the blow if you have a couple of quid on your own team to go down. But it does worry me. I think those odds are a bit generous. The only thing, like I said with Southampton, is six of the next seven games after this are West Ham, Villa, Brentford, Forest, Everton, Southampton. So, again, winnable games on paper, yeah. but it could go That's the That's what other could way. save Leeds, that there's three worse than them. Okay. But when you're looking for three worse than them, Southampton and Forest, yes, I agree. Wolves could well pull herself away. Everton, Bournemouth, West Ham, Leeds. It's going to be tight. Yeah, we're not even halfway through the season. It feels like we've been months and months and months, <laughs> but no, we're back and we're delighted to be so in the Premier League. So, we've been through all the games, Paul. Have you got something in your head, maybe a best bet or a few that you fancy? I think you, you look at the odds. I mean, you, the obvious ones, you've got Liverpool at home, City at home, Newcastle at home, Tottenham at home. All them. You Bankers for you? Potential bankers, yeah, but what you could do is, you know, you're not going to get great odds, but you could get them all to win to nil. I mean, you're backing Spurs not to concede a goal, which is potentially unlikely. But if you go Liverpool, City, Newcastle and Spurs, all at home to win to nil, you're going to get some decent odds. And we started the show talking about City and Haaland, so City for the title for you and Haaland maybe for 45 goals. Haaland will definitely win the golden boot, put it that way. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not think, even betting on that anymore. No, is it, has yeah. it spread paid out again? Yeah. As in well, now? not yet, Almost. but pretty much. Um, I think City have got the quality and I think it depends on the, with the Champions League, how far they go in the Champions League and you know what effect that has on their, their team. But anybody who finishes above City will win the league this year. I don't think anybody will. OK, brilliant to have you in once again. Pleasure Thank for you. your company. Thank you for watching. It is City for the title. City for a big win against Everton at the weekend and that man Erling Haaland to score a few more. We'll see you soon.